welcome to another week of Space Club Career Chats. That's when I think we're in week three. I cannot <laughs> believe it. Time is flying by. <laughs> and it's been so incredible seeing all the submissions from the students around the world. Uh, we know some of you are just getting started with the mission patch. We've seen a lot of roller coasters being submitted. And there's some schools already on mission three, which is that space suit helmet. Um, so we just love those submissions and we will be doing highlights at the end. Of course, the raffle prize is coming up there. So stick around with that. Um, but before I get to my speaker, Aspen, are you ready for the riddle of the day? <laughs> Bring it on. I've been preparing myself. Oh, you've been studying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have, what did the doctor say to the rocket ship? What did the doctor say? Uh-huh. Uh... -huh. uh You're uh, out of fuel. Oh, <laughs> it is time to get your booster shot. Oh, that's cute. That is See, these are so obvious. I just never think of them. Right? <laughs> Every, everybody right. that submits it is so clever. Yeah, I know. And okay, one more. Ready? Okay. How do you know when the moon has enough to eat? When, when it's a full moon. Yes, when it is full. <laughs> we should give you a prize. <laughs> All right. So we have a really awesome speaker joining us today. Yes. Um, we have Dr. Kelly Miller. She's a planetary scientist at Southwest Research Institute in the Space Sciences and Engineering Division in San Antonio, Texas. Um, she's going to be talking to everybody for a little bit, and then we have questions from you guys that we are going to be asking her. So let me bring her on. Dr. Miller, how are you doing? Hi, I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. And so I did leave one more riddle, <laughs> if you would uh -huh. like a chance to answer. Um, so before I get to your presentation, so Aspen, you can help her out. Okay. What happens when you bring meat into space? Meat into space. Weird one, right? Uh, hmm. um, We're going to take that as I have no idea. I have yeah, no idea. I think that it orbits. It uh, <laughs> probably doesn't rot. Uh, I don't know what happens when you bring meat into space. You're thinking too hard. So it gets meteor, hey. right? That's good. Yeah, I liked it. I think okay. I think too much into it. But yeah, y'all are yeah, <laughs> too technical. <laughs> okay, well, you guys who are sending in those riddles, keep them coming because we're having a lot of fun <laughs> stumping all of our guests. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Kelly, the floor is yours. One second here, and we'll be back in a bit. All right. Awesome. Well, and that joke's actually a, a perfect intro, because um, when that, that meat comes back to Earth, uh, you get a meteorite. Um, and, and that's what this first slide is about. So uh, one of the things that I've studied in my career is meteorites. And meteorites are uh, rocks from outer space that, um, that hit Earth, and then we get to study them. Um, so there's a picture of one in the upper right there. That's kind of what it looks like if you um, if you find one on the ground, it's going to look like the, the outside portions of it. There's a strip in the middle that's kind of removed there. And that shows you what the innards look like. Um, and then if you were to slice it open um, and stick it under a, 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 a microscope, um, an imaging microscope, like the one that you can see in the bottom left corner, uh, then you can make pictures like, like the picture on the left there. Um, so on the far left, the different colors are different chemicals that are in the meteorites. Um, and then, and then you can also kind of see how uh, how much the different atoms that are in um, the meteorite weigh, and if they weigh more, then they're brighter, uh, they're white, um, and if they weigh less, then they're darker. And so that helps us look at the chemistry of the meteorites, and that tells us about different um, chemical environments in the solar system. And then on the bottom right, you can see a picture of um, the Allende meteorite. So Allende fell in Mexico in 1969. Um, and it was used uh, kind of as a, a test study before um, the lunar rocks were brought back um, in Apollo. Um, and one of the really cool things about Allende 
is that it has a lot of those uh, little little fluffy white things in it that you see. They're called um, CAIs, calcium aluminum rich inclusions. Um, but what's really cool about the CAIs is that they're the very first solids that formed in our solar system. So they're older than Earth is, and they are 4.568 billion years old. Um, and we know that by measuring uh, lead in, in those CAIs. Um, so that's one of the really cool things about meteorites is that they uh, are, are from the time when planets were forming, and we think that they're um, kind of remnants of planet formation. So when we study them, we can learn all about what um, chemistry was like uh, when, when the solar system was first forming. Um, and that kind of tells us uh, why, why planets um, form the way that they do and why the planets in our solar system are different from each other. Um, so that's pretty cool. Next slide. Okay, so um, speaking of very old things in our solar system, uh, so meteorites come from asteroids um, and, uh, and asteroids are, are small bodies in the solar system, um, much smaller than planets are. Um, and comets are other small bodies in our solar system. And they are also very, very old. Um, and so we think that, uh, comets are also kind of remnants of planet formation, um, or some of the building blocks that were used to, uh, build the planets. Um, but they have, uh, more, more ice, um, more water, um, more uh, gases. Um, so a lot of the, the things that are gas phase um, at warmer temperatures uh, where asteroids formed, um, they turn into ices at colder temperatures where the comets formed. Um, and so different proportions of these um, rocky materials and icy materials uh, are, are put together to build the planets. Um, and the outer solar system uh, has more of the, the icy material in it. So when we study comets, we're, we're partially studying uh, where Earth's atmosphere came from. Um, and then we're also kind of studying um, how the outer solar system got formed. Um, so another project that I'd worked on was looking at um, Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. There's a picture of it on the upper right there. You can see Saturn's rings um, and then Titan behind it. Um, and one of the really cool things about Titan is that it's got this really thick atmosphere. It's even thicker than Earth's atmosphere. And it's the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere. Um, and so we want to know why it has an atmosphere and where it came from and what does that tell us about Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so uh, so one of the, the projects that I've worked on and am working on uh, is kind of looking at um, whether materials from comets uh, could have played a role in forming Titan's atmosphere. And so Comets have some icy material, but then they also have some uh, material that's kind of like um, charcoal. It's it's uh, it's got a lot of carbon in it, um, and also a lot of nitrogen. Um, and so, so one idea that we're testing is um, underneath of Titan's surface, uh, there are different layers, kind of like how Earth has different layers: core, mantle, and crust. Um, so in Titan's core. Uh, if you heat this charcoal material, you can produce gases. And then maybe those gases come out through, uh, through the, the water and ice layers of Titan and contribute to the atmosphere. Um, and in the middle there, you can see uh, um, there's a, a probe that's actually landed on Titan. Um, there's some really cool videos online of it uh, descending through Titan's atmosphere. So go check that out sometime. But this is a picture that it took when it landed on Titan. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Next slide, please. Okay, so another thing that I've worked on um, is studying the, the chemistry of Saturn's rings. Um, so uh, the, the Cassini mission uh, was active at Saturn from 2004 until 2017. And right at the very end there in 2017, um, the spacecraft started to do some orbits like you see in the upper right there. Uh, the, the blue lines there show the, the path that the spacecraft went on. Um, and during that time, it was actually passing between Saturn and its rings. Um, and it took several passes between Saturn and its rings. Um, and that was the closest that the spacecraft ever got to Saturn's rings during its 13 year mission. Um, and, uh, and the, the team noticed when we were flying between Saturn and the rings 
that uh, there was a lot of um, a lot of material, a lot of chemicals in that space in between that we didn't expect. So we were expecting to see hydrogen and helium, which are the main chemical compounds in Saturn's atmosphere. And instead, we measured uh, things like water and methane. Um, and it turns out that that was coming from the rings and the rings are falling into Saturn's atmosphere. The very most innermost ring is falling in um, and it's falling in really fast or it was um, during that time period when the spacecraft was flying like that. Um, and uh, so if, if it, we don't know um, how long, how, how often it's falling in that fast. Um, if it's always falling that fast, then that probably means that the rings are actually really young uh, and they didn't form when planets formed. They formed uh, maybe like when the dinosaurs were around here on Earth. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of a fun thing to think about is um, if dinosaurs had a telescope and they looked at Saturn, would it have a ring or not? Um, and we don't quite know the answer uh, yet because we don't know. Um, if, if the rings are always falling in at the same rate or not, but but maybe they wouldn't have seen rings if they had a telescope. So dinosaurs and telescopes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the project that I'm really actively involved in, oops, back one slide, please. Okay, uh, my, my main project right now, I'm working on, um, an instrument that's going to go to uh, Jupiter's moon, Europa. Um, so that's a, a, an artist's sketch on the left-hand side um, of this mission, the Europa Clipper mission, uh, and it's flying over um, a, a drawing of Europa's surface. Um, and one of the cool things about Europa is that we are um, pretty confident that there is a liquid water ocean underneath its icy crust. Um, and so this mission, the Europa Clipper mission, um, its main goal is to figure out um, if Europa is habitable. So um, could, could something live there um, or not? So we're going to go measure and see. We know that there's liquid water there in the ocean, but we don't know um, if, if any of that liquid water ever makes it up to the surface at all. Um, and we're going to go look for, um, you know, the chemicals that are used in life um, and see if there's energy there or not. So one of the instruments that we're sending for that is called a mass spectrometer. Um, and it's kind of like a, a sniffer. Um, we're going to go sniff the atmosphere around Europa. Um, and then we're going to learn what it's made out of. And that's going to help us answer those questions about habitability. So you can see a picture of a mass spectrometer like the one that we're going to send to Europa in the upper right there. And then in the lower right there, that's a, a photo from September um, of me and my coworker um, testing this instrument. You can see some of the data on the computer screen there. Um, so we got to operate um, the exact instrument that's going to go fly around Europa. Um, it's going to launch in October 2024. So, uh, so that's been pretty, pretty cool and exciting to, to operate something that's going to Jupiter. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, those are the, the slides that I have to share today um, about the work that I do as a, as a planetary scientist. Um, so. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm still stuck on this Saturn's rings that are falling into the atmosphere and I, I'm guessing whenever you went or when you sent this probe there, that wasn't something you expected. So you had some like research questions and then this was like an unexpected result. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think, um, so I started to get involved with that project really heavily just, just a few weeks before those data were collected. And I sat down uh, with the group leader and we said, okay, we're going to look at hydrogen and helium at Saturn and we're going to try and figure out how much helium there is because um, that's going to tell us about planet formation and that's what this data set is going to have. And then and we said, okay, great, that's the plan. And then, yeah, weeks later, the data started to come in and we said, well, what is what is all this stuff in the data? Why, why do we see water? Why do we see methane? Um, and at first it was just kind of a big question mark. And then as, as the spacecraft started to get closer and closer to Saturn, um, we could kind of track and see that, that there were more of those compounds when we were closer to the rings and, and less when we were closer to Saturn. 
Um, and so it was like a, I don't know, like a treasure hunt trying to piece together where these unexpected results were coming from and how do we interpret them and why is it happening? And there, there's still some, some questions that remain. At the very end, uh, the spacecraft plunged into Saturn's atmosphere and that's how we disposed of it. And so we, we aren't getting any more <laughs> new data now. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's a, a pretty, pretty intriguing trail of clues. Um, and yeah. one of the possible results is that, yeah, the rings are, are pretty young. And I, I think that's such a cool insight to how science really works uh, because students in the classroom often have the scientific method and you have a hypothesis and then you know, yes or no, is my hypothesis correct? But mm -hmm. it's often not that straightforward and it seems like a really messy process uh, because you don't exactly know what you even want to ask and you're kind of collecting data and see where it leads you. Um, so I hope that gives uh, students like an, another view of science um, that makes it a little bit more exciting. Like there's no answer in the back of the book. Like we don't know. Like that's the whole point is to figure out what we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. It's 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 really exciting. It's very dynamic. Yeah. Okay, so let me get to the questions from the students. So, um, Aspen, if you want to ask our first question. Sure. So, this is from Space Rangers in New York. How does chemistry help space exploration? Yeah, great question. Um, so, I talked a little bit about this on, on my slides um, that I shared, but uh, so uh, chemistry kind of helps us track. Um, different processes for, for planet formation, for example. So we can figure out uh, if we want to learn um, why do some planets have a lot of water uh, and why do other planets not have a lot of water. Um, then we need to go uh, measure the chemistry of different objects. We need to know how much water is at each of those planets. So that's you know measuring the chemistry of those planets to answer those questions. And then that tells us you know about um, whether life could have uh, originated at those planets or, um, or could, could it support human life in the future? If we, if we, um, you know, we're going to build a, a, a base or a habitat there, what do we need to bring with us? Um, so it's important for, for a lot of those, uh, reasons. It helps us figure out, um, how, um, how planets evolve, um, and what, what parts of their environments are interacting and, and how they're changing. And what motivated you to go into like chemistry specifically, like within planetary science? Um, so my undergraduate degree was in uh, just straight up chemistry. Um, yeah, and I, um, I guess I originally started out I wanted to be a marine biologist, um, and then I had a professor who was who was just really great, um, and he was in chemistry. Um, and I think I think maybe one of the moments when I decided, oh, I want to switch over, he was talking about. Um, colors and the way that we perceive colors of different objects and how that's related to the the way that the molecules in them are, are arranged. And I just thought that was like the coolest insight that uh, we're like little little human instruments and we're measuring chemistry all the time and we don't even know it. So um, yeah. Very cool. cool. Thanks. Um, and this is a follow-up to what you were just talking about. Did Mars ever have water? A Martian from New Jersey. Yeah, great question. Um, yes, Mars does have water, um, and uh, it has it has water today. So um, there's ongoing research to kind of figure out where that water is and how how accessible accessible it is. Um, so we know that there's water beneath the surface of Mars. Um, there's also water in the the polar caps. So if you look at a picture of Mars, a lot of times you'll see white polar caps. Um, on it. Um, and a lot of that material is water. Um, and then there's kind of an ongoing debate in planetary science about whether that water is ever um, at the surface and briefly liquid or if it's always kind of frozen beneath the surface. Um, and so if we look at surface features on Mars, um, sometimes you see uh, changes in the surface that, that some re researchers um, hypothesize are caused by, um, you know, flowing of water, uh, but that's an area of ongoing research. So uh, we, we don't know yet if that hypothesis is correct or not. All right. Is there anything that you wish someone had told you when you were younger that you can tell us from Galaxy Invaders in Texas? Hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah. Um, no hmm. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Timeless wisdom uh, on the spot. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think maybe, um, maybe what I would have, what it's taken me time to learn, um, is that not, not feeling like you know a lot about something um, is is an opportunity and not not something that's scary or intimidating, right? So, um, if there's an area of of science or anywhere in your life really, and you feel like you don't understand it very much, um, that's that's okay because uh, everyone's at that point at some point in their life where they don't understand it, and and you just go learn about it and. Maybe you'll find something really cool, uh, and it's an opportunity. Oh, yeah, I like that. And I think it's important to like emphasize like learning outside the classroom too. Like you don't have to wait for your teacher to talk about it in class. Like you can find books or websites or stuff to continue learning like what you're interested in. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Or through Space Club and our experts. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so now we have a question from Illinois. Lunar ladies want to know. What is the craziest thing you've come across during your research? And you just shared some really cool stuff. Um, You have any other crazy (laughs) things? Um, I guess, I guess I didn't talk too much on the meteorite slide, but one of the really cool things about those, uh, those meteorites. um, So there were those uh, kind of round or, or yeah, circular or oval shapes in the meteorites. Right. Um, and the reason the reason that they have that shape, because um, if you if you've ever seen uh, an astronaut on the International Space Station um, drink water or or tang, um, maybe you noticed that it forms these bubbles uh, before they before they eat it, right? Um, so it's the surface tension of the liquid. Um, and so the reason that there are those round shapes in the meteorites um, is because those components used to be liquid, so they were like little blocks of lava floating around in space um, before they pulled together into the rock. Um, So I I didn't discover that. But um, but one thing that I did find in the meteorites that I was studying in grad school um, was that some of those uh, have have sulfur chemistry instead of um, silicon chemistry. So um, so that's pretty cool. Or I thought it was. Yeah, that's really cool. That's awesome. All right, so I am gonna end here with the questions and I'm gonna share some highlights now from what the students have been working on. And Dr. Miller, if you can stick around for a couple minutes, um, because I have a couple things that the students submitted at the end that I would like your perspective on. Um, So we're gonna share here. Okay, so these are some of the highlights uh, from this week. And so Aspen, if you wanna tell us who we got. Yeah, so we have Academy of Our Lady of Peace from New Jersey. So this is an, a roller coaster. Aspire Indian International School, Kuwait, and Pakistan English School in Kuwait. And a lot of these are videos, so that's why they're kind of blurry, but we got some really cool videos of these working. All right, Indian Central School in Kuwait. Love seeing everybody's designs, so cool. May Lester Stevens Jr. in Texas. I think we have bottle caps down here. So these are like skewers and they're put in like a bottle cap. It was just a really clever use of materials. (laughs) That's pretty cool. New Century International, North Carolina. And can you guys, yeah, see this like backdrop and then there's like a rocket on top of the (laughs) roller coaster. (laughs) I just loved it. All right, Wilkins Junior High School, Illinois. Working on our spacesuits here. All right. So one of the questions, this was for mission two, we asked, would you travel to the moon? And so I picked out some of the student responses. Um, Dr. Miller, would you travel to the moon? Absolutely. In a heartbeat. All right. So so this is Galaxy Wars from New Jersey. Yes, because I want to feel the moon, see the craters, and get samples of it to see what those samples would do on Earth, just like a scientist would. And then we have Hiba from Kuwait. I would love to travel to the moon. I would like to experience moonwalking. I also want to look back at how our planet looks from the moon and discover the unseen part of the moon. 
Yes. All right, we got one interesting comment though, which was no, we would not go to the moon because it would serve no purpose. And I just was like, you know what? I need to ask our expert her opinion because I think some um, of the public says, why do we spend so much money on agencies like NASA that get us to the moon? And now we're talking about going to Mars and all the research that you've done and sending out satellites and probes What's the point of it all? What do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and I think for for me personally, um, it's kind of kind of the same as why why the arts are important, why it's important to to make music or to um, you know create paintings or, or create anything, right? It's it's like an expression of our humanity, um, and it's what makes us makes us human to, to express these ideas and um, and continue to, to expand um, what we what we know and um, yeah our, our understanding of where we come from um, and where we could go in the future um, yeah. so I, I think um, I think that there there are lots of very important problems here on earth. Um, and it's really good to, to address those. Um, but I think it's also really important not to lose sight of, of our humanity and, and to express that. And, and one important way to express that is um, to keep, keep uh, asking and keep finding answers to those questions that, that people have been asking since, since forever, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of the research that, uh, that Galileo was doing back in what was that? Probably the six, 1600s or something. Um, yeah, <laughs> he was asking the same questions, right? right? That's, they're important questions. So, um, so that's the that's my like philosophical reason why I think um, it's important to do these things and valuable to do these things. Um, and then I think there's also the the practical side of it, which is that um, that investing in um, in space exploration. Uh, has it, it pays dividends um, in a more concrete way also um, and yeah, some of that is that. Yeah. inspiring folks to do to do research that's applied here on earth and then some of it is directly applying um, the results to create new technologies here on earth so I think this is a, a list from jet propulsion laboratory uh, of ways that space exploration have benefited the technologies that we use here on earth all the time. Landmine removal, that's pretty important. Athletic yeah. Those are that's kind of cool. So yeah. Space construction technology. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that's my answer. Um, what do y'all think? I mean, I don't know if I could say it any better. I think it's part curiosity. We're always seeking to explore and learn, and it's just an innate Thing that humans have and it keeps us dreaming and motivated um, when the first uh, humans landed on the moon that was just a moment of humanity um, that people that were then watching that as kids wanted to be scientists and engineers and um, you know dream big and I feel like space is something that brings us all together there's a lot of politics and kind of nasty stuff that happens in the world and space is just this um amazing place like we have the international space station we can all work together and live together and that keeps me excited about being a human <laughs> that's what i think yeah i think it also pushes us to be better too because like you know we go to the moon and then what's next mars and that brings so much more innovation and you saw that innovation that it, you know nasa products turn into you know, household items and you wouldn't even have, you know, phone cameras and be able to go on your social media apps without <laughs> NASA. So uh, it's, yeah. you know, I think NASA and space exploration is like in our lives every day, even if we don't realize it. Exactly. Okay. So that gets us to raffle prizes. <laughs> okay. So as we wrap up, um, we have two teams that participated in um, submitting this week. You will get this really cool retro NASA shirt and these awesome uh, mission patch stickers. And so let me uh, switch screens real quick and I am going to pull up our picker wheel. Aspen, are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. I know everyone else is. 
<laughs> okay, so what's going to happen is we have all of the teams wow. in this wheel, and we are going to spin the wheel. And we have two teams. So here's our first one. Brought to you by Target, apparently. And congratulations, uh, Bloom Carol Spaceballs. All right, so now we're going to one more team. Ready? Let's do it. Awesome, Calvary Christian School, Cameron. All right, congratulations, students. Um, we will be contacting your teacher to get you those uh, awesome raffle prizes. And if you win, you go right back in the raffle every time if you keep submitting. So we wanna see those awesome projects. Uh, Space suits is probably what most students are gonna be working on. Um, great job, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Miller, for joining us today. And we'll see everyone next week. Bye. All right, thanks.